tonight once again from the beautiful Performing Arts Center there in Miami and from our NBC News headquarters here in New York, our special live coverage of this first round of Democratic debates for the 2020 campaign for the White House. This would be round two. So many Democrats in this race and on that stage, we had to spread them out over two nights, two events. This second installment brings some heavy hitters to the stage. Biden, Sanders, Buttigieg, Harris, not going first has its advantages, including getting to see in real time how a strong performance can jolt a campaign and how a weak performance can doom a campaign. We're less than two hours from the start now. Brian Williams here with you from New York. I'm joined by Nicole Wallace, host of Deadline White House and, of course, former communications director in the Bush 43 White House. So one person we know will be watching tonight, Donald Trump. He couldn't resist live tweeting night one from aboard Air Force One. And if tonight is a repeat, consider the irony that President Trump will be watching the Democratic debate while getting ready to meet with Vladimir Putin tomorrow at the G20. It'll be their first meeting since Robert Mueller finished his investigation. His report, of course, found close to 150 contacts between Trump associates and Russians. How's that for a backdrop? Joining us here <laughs> at the table, Chris Hayes, host of All In, and our contributors, Claire McCaskill, former U.S. Democratic Senator from the great state of Missouri, and Eugene Robinson, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist with the Washington Post. Also, of course, joining us throughout the evening is that man, Steve Kornacki, who has brought <laughs> along some numbers to share with us tonight. Here is the lineup, night two of these Democratic debates from left to right as they will appear on stage. Author and activist Marianne Williamson, former Colorado governor John Hickenlooper, entrepreneur Andrew Yang, mayor of South Bend, Indiana, Pete Buttigieg, former Vice President Joe Biden, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, California Senator Kamala Harris, New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, Colorado Senator Michael Bennett, and California Congressman Eric Swalwell. We begin again tonight with our friend Chris Matthews, host of Hardball. He would normally be on the air at this hour tonight again, finds him in the spin room in Miami. And Chris uh, made a liar out of it last night. No mention of Joe Biden from the stage. That, of exactly. course, changes tonight. I think so. I think, remember when we were kids, we played King of the Hill? And somebody gets up on the hill and somebody, everybody else tries to drag him down and he tries to stay on the top of the hill. Will Joe Biden be able to stop of the hill, stay on top of the hill tonight? I guess he's going to get shot at, uh, hit politically by perhaps indirect shots about the need for big change, not just beating Trump, and perhaps direct shots about whatever in his past is vulnerable. But I think his reaction is key. Will he take the bait? Will he go to war with one of the other candidates and let them rise, or will he avoid that fight? I think that's the key thing to look for, his reaction to any shot at him. And, uh, Chris, I have to ask about the Bernie Sanders factor. This is a guy who, in just recent weeks, felt the need to give a speech about the socialism part of his party affiliation, Democratic Socialist. Well, you know, that's a big question for him. I've looked at the old tapes of his interview with Phil Donahue, where he really does defend the notion of socialism, not just a welfare state like in Scandinavia, but real socialism, no profit motive, no free markets. The government basically runs the economy. And, of course, a good question for him, I don't think a Democrat will ask it, name the government that has run an effective economy in the history of man. Governments are not good at running economies. The market tends to work. I think that'll be an issue, but ideologically, I think most of the Democrats are afraid to go after Bernie. I think in a way he's uh, up there as, but the age issue, I think the age issue tonight is gonna be so spectacular. Two guys who will be 80 years old in either their first or second years as president. Two people sitting next to both of them who are very much in the usual age area, or a bit beyond, before that, certainly uh, Pete Buttigieg is a, a young man at 37, and Kamala Harris is a young person as well. Uh, they, they will be sitting right next to them. I think that matchup between the young and the older will be vivid tonight. All right, Chris, we'll be coming back to you. And Nicole, uh, <laughs> Chris just mentioned Kamala Harris. Yeah. This is seen as a potentially giant evening for her. She never misses a moment to have a moment. You and I were anchoring yeah. the bar testimony and um, people that know her well and have served with, with her were probably not at all surprised about what happened. But um, for those of us who had sort of watched Barr with amazement as he seemed to throw Mueller and the two-year investigation under the bus and drive back 
and forth over it. She stopped that operation in its track the prosecutor with her, her questioning her. And, and, and to see her, you know, every time she has uh, the stage, literally and figuratively, she makes a big impression and seems to do herself a whole lot of good. Senator Bennett uh, is arriving uh, at this is the candidate's entrance, not quite the Academy Awards, yet this is the way they like it. Uh, Chris Hayes, your preview of tonight. I, well, I think the two people at this, the, the center of the stage uh, are, are, are sort of studying contrast in certain ways, although similar in other ways, yeah. uh, as, as Chris mentioned. Um, they're the two people that are at the top of just about every poll as we've yeah. been polling through. They are sort of a study contrast in terms of their temperament, their ideological profile, the thing that they are saying about where the future of the Democratic Party is, even diagnosing the problem. I think it's going to be very interesting to see the decisions that Bernie Sanders makes about how to deal with Joe Biden. I think there is an impulse, and we've seen it with him, to draw the contrast. I mean, they sort of came out of the gate, and he would be a little sort of too cute by half. He came on my show a few times, and I'd say, well, are you criticizing Joe Biden? You'd say, you think? <laughs> you know, he wouldn't actually go there, right? That was very good. My, I very good. Do a decent we break. need a few uh, of those tonight. <laughs> I think that it'll be interesting to see how they handle that. If I were advising the Sanders people, I think they are introducing Sanders again, reintroducing yeah. him to a big Democratic party. It was 14 million people or so last night, last night, watched last night, more, more tonight, I think. I think what they should do is have him play against type in terms of being a sort of peacemaker and bridge builder. I think people know that he has a sort of distinct brand of politics. It has a distinct name. He is a distinct person. I think the thing they need to, to, to communicate out past the 15 to 20 to 25 percent of people that are already with him is that he can be uh, a sort of bigger tent part of the Democratic coalition. But is there a single example of him ever doing that? I mean, I think he, well, uh, the senator can talk more I mean, about that. Like, I, don't, I, don't I, mean, say, like, I don't disagree with you yeah. at a strategic campaign objective level. That is absolutely his strategic objective. Yeah. I can't think of a single example, and I really only started watching him in 16, of him ever doing that. Well, he's worked with tons of different people on a ton of different legislation. Like he has like friends? You do. I yeah, I and think he, he made. Does. I mean, again, I never served with him, but <laughs> also it's a. <laughs> Claire, Claire, the thought bubble is like. Here, really. I know. I'm like. Uh, so here's the deal. Please be candid. <laughs> that is is flawed in your analysis. Is that Bernie would ever listen to somebody on strategy? I mean, he is somebody who absolutely gives the back of his hand to the notion that he needs to make political decisions. I respect him because he's driven by a deep passion to certain ideas. Many of them I disagree with, but that's who he is. And he thinks all this falderall about polling and personal attacks on people is all just total BS. Yes. And the notion he believes that, that honestly. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and the notion that somebody that. would sit in a room with him and say, Bernie, you need to be a nicer version of yourself tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Bernie would like turn around and walk out of the room and probably give him like, eh, you know, what are you talking about? I'm going to be who I am. And so that authenticity is his strength. Yeah. I don't think we're going to see him um, tread lightly. I do think Joe Biden has to not let his temper get him tonight because I think he is capable of taking it personally yes, yes. when somebody goes after his record mm. and if he has the discipline which that is the big question over Joe Biden is discipline mm -hmm. to pivot and punch not other candidates in the Democratic Party but Trump it's hard. he's got to pivot yeah. and punch yeah. Trump he will probably mention that Bernie Sanders voted for that crime bill Right. He will probably mention that the NRA was a big supporter of Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I would imagine in passing, but if he's smart, he will not take the bait. He will not defend himself. He will say it's time to look forward. This is all about Donald Trump. You and Nicole have both done debate prep on different ends of the scale. How do you prep a candidate for a different way to say you had to be there? You know, I, I, I want to hear your thoughts first, because I, I think there's something similar to briefing Bernie than to briefing McCain. And I, and, but I'm, I want to hear from you first. Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um, I mean, briefing Biden. Yeah, I, I think that Biden uh, knows. I mean, you, the clip that was played all day on this network was the most memorable debate moment of Joe Biden was when he gave a one-word answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He knows that he has to... Like, come on, don't talk so long. Keep it short. Talk about the future, not the past. Um, don't brag about your record. You need to give people the perspective. You've been out of Washington for four years. 
you know, you've been out here talking to people and traveling the country, and you now see that Washington is terribly flawed, not owning I'm the guy who can run the Senate. Uh, and that's where he's got to really change his view. And I think, I think his people have worked very hard at this, and it won't surprise me if he manages that discipline tonight. Well, I, I agree with that. I, I also think, though, just in terms of preparing someone who's served in the Senate, I think the whole strategic objective for a campaign is to turn perceived weaknesses into assets yep, and to goes. hang a lantern. He has to, I think, come out tonight and find out how to hang a lantern around his perceived weakness of having been around a long time, huh. of having been there Probably so long thinks. that some of the references that have been covered as gaffes, and I'm not sure voters have experienced them the same way. I think we cover Biden in a different way than voters seem to experience Biden. Well, what, yep. Hang what a voters, lantern around those. What voters experience is that in between that long Senate service in the Senate, and now was eight years as Barack Obama's vice president. That's what they yep. And if so, if yes. I'm Joe Biden, um, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. I'm talking about that a lot, um, because that is still the sort of, sort of beating heart, I think, of the, of the Democratic Party, especially for important constituencies like African-American voters, Latino voters, suburban women, you name it. Uh, everybody loves Obama, and Biden was right there. I do think he has to be sort of above it all in this debate if, if, to the extent that he can right. um, um, because he's been above it all in the polls. He is he's the guy and he can be sort of generous and sort of you know, presidential. Mm -hmm. He can go after go after Trump. Um, if he falters, uh, if, if there's some lapse there, um, whatever, of whatever kind, people will be comparing those other candidates to him, and they'll be saying, well, what about Kamala Harris? What about people? Can I press you on that, though? Because, I mean, we were talking about this before. I mean, let's just be brutally honest. Some of the people that are on the campaign trail covering him describe what you just described, right. that he sometimes falters. Well, he's... Sometimes Michelle this Goldberg would, this would not Times. this yes. would not be a good night to falter. This well, would be a good night to have a good night. And there's there's, <laughs> there's more than that because there's there's also a bunch of substantive questions, right? I mean, we saw some sharp differences last night. We saw them on two areas: criminalization of illegal entry in the United States, which is Section 1235 of the Immigration and Naturalization Act, and we saw it also on Medicare for all and abolishing private insurance. There will be substantive moments tonight of distinction. My question for Joe Biden is: I don't know what the priority of the Biden agenda is domestically. I have a pretty good sense of some of the other candidates. I don't know what, like, what's Joe Biden's first bill? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Cancer moonshot. Yeah. You think that's the first piece of legislation I think it may be moves? close to it because it is one of the things that is absolutely killing our health care system, the costs associated with it. It has touched every family in America. It brings home something in his personal story that's very real, and I think he knows a lot about it. But um, if, that's, if that's the case, what he's going to have to do time and time again here t tonight is make the substantive case for where he is on things like criminalization of illegal entry or Medicare for all or climate carbon tax, right? Like, he's just got to show that, like, he's thought about this stuff and here's where he, he, here's where he is. Hey, Chris Matthews, two things. Number one, McCaskill's clearly running. Number two, <laughs> I wanted to get you on record before we go to a break to get Absolutely in on this conversation. Not. Well, I think uh, the senator is fabulous. I agree with almost everything she always says. And, of course, I think Nicole was so right about hanging a lantern. That was Bobby Kennedy's phrase. When he was accused of being ruthless, he'd kid about it. Because you have to acknowledge what everybody knows about you, because you're the only one keeping the secret to yourself. Everybody knows this problem about Biden. He's been around an awful long time. So he has to find an advantage in that. And I think he has to also avoid being dragged into this sweep to the left. He can't say, I'm going to make illegal entry into the country legal. It doesn't make any sense. Decriminalize. He also has to say, I want to keep uh, I want to keep insurance companies around. People should have added insurance if they have Medicare right now. Why not allow them to keep doing it in the future? It just seems to be vindictive to get rid of all insurance companies under the law if it's even legal. I think Biden has to be Biden, a moderate Democrat with some progressive tendencies. But he also has to admit he's Joe Biden. And I think I think uh, Claire is so right about that. And Nicole, you can't hide from being Joe Biden tonight. And uh, part of being Joe Biden is flawed. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.